Thank you very much for joining us for this interview, which is sponsored by the Jamini Chair in Trade and Environmental Conflict. Today we have the great opportunity to have a special guest, Professor Nicolas de Sadelier. He is Professor in European Law and Environmental Law at the St. Louis University and the Catholic University of Louvain. Professor, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Today we will discuss the so popular, um, the so-called polluter pays principle. Uh, given that the use of environmental goods uh, typically gives rise to what economists call externalities, which may be positive or negative, um, my question to you is, um, what does this principle reflect from a legal perspective? Uh, from a legal perspective, the polluter pays principle can be described as a rule of cost allocation requiring the polluters to integrate it mm -hmm. in the prices uh, of their services or products, the cost uh, of the, the environmental impacts. So in other words, polluters should not uh, become free riders at the expense of the collectivities. Uh, however, the apparent simplicity uh, of the principle belies uh, a number of ambiguities. Uh, the meaning of the terms of polluter and uh, paying appear self-evident at the first glance. Uh, however, uh, these terms become elusive uh, as one attempts to define them. Well, thank you. Um, what would be the legal status of the uh, polluter pays principle in the legal, um, in the legal European order? Uh, as a matter of EU law, I want us to differentiate four different issues. Firstly, the principle is enshrined in a number of international agreements to which the EU and a number of member states are parties. So, for instance, uh, different agreements regarding regional seas uh, do encapsulate uh, the principle. So this is the case of the 1992 uh, OSPAR Convention on the Protection of the North Sea and the Northeast Atlantic that uh, reads as follows. Uh, the contracting parties shall apply the polluters pays principle by virtue of which the cost of pollution prevention, control and reduction measures are to be borne by the polluters. In virtue of Article 216 of the T Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, uh, the uh, EU is bound uh, by uh, such a commitment. Secondly, the principle is encapsulated under Article 191, Paragraph 7 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and accordingly, uh, all secondary legislation such as directives, decisions, uh, recommendations, uh, regulations uh, have to uh, be uh, drafted uh, in accordance with the principle. So, um, uh, in other words, the, the secondary uh, legislation uh, should uh, reflect uh, the principle encapsulated uh, in treaty law. So, um, uh, accordingly, uh, these secondary acts are subordinated uh, to treaty law. Uh, thirdly, uh, the lawmaker, uh, the European Parliament as well as the Council of Ministers, uh, have been uh, defining, have been uh, reflecting uh, the mm -hmm. Article uh, 91, uh, Paragraph 2 uh, obligations uh, into specific directives such as the 2060 Directive on Water Management or the Landfill Directive on the Waste Management Directive 2008-18. And so uh, these different provisions enshrined in these directives uh, do uh, mirror uh, cost allocation rule, uh, do mirror uh, or do reflect a cost effectiveness, uh, a cost effectiveness rule uh, that's encapsulated uh, in the principle. Last but not least, um, at the fourth stage, uh, the principle has also been developed by the European Commission uh, through a web of guidelines regarding state aids or a specific uh, recommendation adopted by the uh, Council in 1974, the uh, 74346 uh, recommendation uh, regarding the implementation by the Member States uh, of that principle. Uh, these instruments are deemed not to bind uh, the Member States, nonetheless, uh, the Member States uh, are required to pay uh, 
uh, heed uh, to the ways in which uh, the principle has been fleshed out into these soft law instruments. Okay, well, thank you. Um, now, in order to identify the uh, polluter, may the authority uh, charge each person who has uh, actually contributed to the harm uh, on the grounds of uh, equity, or for the sake of efficiency, would it be preferable um, to, um, to charge a person who is the best place to pay? Uh, professor, who should pay um, the pollution charges? Well, it's a very relevant question. The, the person who causes the pollution uh, is not always uh, easy to identify. Mm. Uh, there are usually more than one uh, economic agent uh, contributing to the nuisance, uh, be it the vehicle manufacturer, be it the fuel producer, uh, be it uh, the retailer, uh, be it the owner of the vehicle, uh, be it the passenger. Uh, so the, the solution, uh, as a matter of fact, is to uh, collect uh, the charge at those points uh, which are deemed to be the most efficient from an administrative as well as from an economic perspective. Uh, so uh, rules of clarity and transparency uh, should prevail in identifying who is the producer. Okay, thank you. Uh, and in the interest of simplicity, could you maybe give an illustration? Well, for instance, um, regarding the uh, charges placed uh, upon uh, recycled uh, bottles or reusable bottles or uh, the different tax arrangements, uh, it's easier to place these charges upon the importers or the producers of these bottles instead of charging the consumers uh, on the grounds that the public authorities do uh, cope with but a few hundreds importers and producers, uh, whereas they, have, they will have to deal with thousands uh, of uh, millions of consumers, mm -hmm. you know? Now that we have identified uh, the polluter, the question still is how much should the polluter actually be charged? Well, of importance is to differentiate two uh, different approaches, uh, albeit entangled. On the one hand, the state authorities uh, are likely to embrace a redist redistributive approach, according to which uh, the cost uh, of the charge uh, should reflect, uh, as a matter uh, of uh, fact, the uh, concrete expenses uh, to which the public authorities are exposed. So the, the charge, the amount of the charges, uh, should be proportional. Uh, to the cost of public intervention regarding surveillance, control, monitoring, remediation of the environmental harm. Besides, public authorities are also likely to embrace a much more incitative approach in uh, charging to a greater extent the services or the goods which are much more hazardous uh, to the environment than the average services or the average goods. So in so doing, the public authorities are likely to penalize the economic agents placing on the market uh, the most hazardous goods or the most hazardous services uh, for the sake of the improvement of the state of the environment. Okay, thank you. Um, now, concerning the allocation of charge revenues, um, it's not clear whether the allocation of the revenue uh, from charges also gives rise to a number of questions. Um, nothing seems to indicate whether the sums collected should be set aside in a special fund um, or if they should be paid into the general state budget. Um, Professor, what are your views on the matter? Well, I take your point entirely. Uh, the OECD and the European Commission in the course of the 1970s uh, did not take a clear position regarding the allocation of the proceeds of the charges, uh, whether these proceeds uh, should be channeled uh, into uh, specific environmental funds uh, which are aiming to cover the state expenses regarding uh, monitoring, surveillance, remediations, or whether uh, they should be allocated to the general state budget. My view uh, is that uh, environmental uh, policy requires uh, 
a huge amount of financial support and so from an environmental policy point of view of importance is to channel the proceeds into specific funds regarding nature conservation, regarding water protection, regarding uh, air pollution, uh, regarding the enhancements of biodiversity and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now, the polluter pays principle has shifted from the public sphere to the civil liability. Um, now, the question is, becomes if the liability is the correct device to implement the polluter pays principle. Like you've just said, um, it's usually difficult to identify who is the polluter. It may be the manufacturer, the property owner, um, the license holder. They all may be liable for um, pollution. Now, uh, the question becomes even more uh, complicated uh, in the case of diffuse pollution where multiple causes produce single effects. Can the polluter pays principle be taken into consideration by courts um, when identifying who is the party responsible for the damage? Uh, this is a very relevant question. Uh, um, again, uh, there is a, there's been a tendency among academic circles and among uh, several international organizations to ascribe a curative function to the polluter pays principles. If uh, the polluter pays principles were not to be applied in case of uh, industrial pollution or in case of diffuse pollution, mm -hmm. the state authorities will have to pay the cost of the environmental remediation and that will run counter uh, the principle. Um, so environmental liability uh, could be a means by which um, uh, state authorities could uh, avoid uh, to uh, cover uh, financially uh, the environmental uh, damages. Besides, environmental liability is likely to enhance pre the preventive function uh, of the principle. Uh, however, a number of questions uh, do remain unanswered, uh, as you correctly stress, who is uh, liable, uh, to what extent the liable party uh, should pay, uh, which damage is deemed to be covered. So the, the question arises as to whether uh, courts are likely to embrace uh, the uh, implementation of the polluter pays principle in liability litigations. Uh, so far, the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, has been uh, answering uh, questions referred by national jurisdictions regarding cost allocations uh, in the area of waste management and the Court of Justice in two landmark judgments, uh, Commune de Mesquer and uh, Van de Waal, um, took the view that uh, civil liability regarding waste ma management could be channeled uh, towards the producer of the goods that uh, became later on um, uh, a waste, uh, in as much as uh, that producer uh, was uh, deemed to be uh, at fault, or um, in as much as he was deemed to be negligent uh, in. Um, um, selling or in uh, transferring uh, the goods to a supplier. Uh, so in so doing, the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, has been uh, applying the polluter pays principle uh, not in a, a, a priori approach but in a, a posteriori approach mm -hmm. regarding civil liability. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, this video will uh, help us in understanding state aids, which we will address next week. Thank you.